I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, our sponsor of the show is the Great Courses Plus. It looks like this is an app on your phone. You just touch the app like that. It opens right up. Here's a course that I took called The History of Secret Societies. So you can, you can watch these uh, as video or you can just listen to them as audio. I just listen to them as audio. This particular course has 26 lectures, each of which is about 30 minutes long. And if you listen to them at 1.2 speed, it's about a 20 minute uh, lecture. So that's perfect for commuting drives or a workout or whatever. You can uh, knock off a couple lectures and do an entire course like this in the matter of a few days to a week. Um, and so here's the deal. If you sign up for the uh, Great Courses uh, Plus app you uh, uh, through me, you get a $30 discount uh, on the annual fee and a free trial. So if you go to um, greatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer, you'll get that, uh, that free trial and that discount. It comes out to about 10 bucks a month. It's a great deal. Uh, so again, it's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer uh, to get that deal. And uh, it's a great uh, way to get uh, access um, to a lot of content. My guest today is the great Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil is the host of the popular podcast Star Talk Radio and Emmy Award winning National Geographic Channel shows Star Talk and, of course, Cosmos. He's done two of the Cosmos series, rebooted from the original series with Carl Sagan. He earned his BA in physics from Harvard and his PhD in astrophysics from Columbia. The author of more than a dozen books, including the best selling Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, Tyson is the first. Frederick P. Rose, director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, where he lives with his wife and two children. You can access uh, Neil at Facebook at Neil deGrasse Tyson, Instagram at Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Twitter at Neil Tyson. In this uh, episode, wow, we cover the big stuff. The book is a um, huge and beautiful coffee table book called Cosmic Queries, Star Talk's Guide to Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going. So we discuss really all the big questions. Uh, the, the, uh, I start off with uh, Rumsfeld known knowns and then known unknowns and unknown knowns. So we talk about what, uh, why there is something rather than nothing, what there was before the Big Bang, what caused the, bang, the Big Bang to bang, uh, the origins of life, panspermia or directed panspermia, what extraterrestrial intelligences might be like, the problem uh, and fears with artificial intelligence, maybe will be, um, essentially a deity uh, creating an artificial intelligence that is effectively omniscient. Um, we talk about um, the uh, how, how big the universe is, how we know about that uh, in terms of uh, measuring the universe. We talk about archaeoastronomy, Stonehenge, Neil's own discovery of a Manhattan Henge, that is the alignment of buildings like the alignment of stones in Stonehenge uh, with um, the sunrise and sunset. And then we uh, kind of wrap up talking about the big rip at the end of the universe. So how it all begins and how it will all end. And in there, we also throw in some stuff about the multiverse and how science works. And we even get in uh, to morality and, and to what extent uh, mor moral sense of right and wrong is in our nature. And uh, so we really cover most of the great topics. So with that, I'll give you Neil deGrasse Tyson. The new book is Cosmic Queries. Star Talk's guide to who we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Yet another slim, um, narrow, narrowly focused book from Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's just about you know uh, everything. <laughs> I have to say, you know, Neil, I usually listen to my uh, guest books, but this one is just too sumptuous and and gorgeous. Natural yeah. Geographic. I mean, just these beautiful, you know, four color uh, paintings and and photographs and graphs and charts throughout. Really nicely done. And uh, but uh, you know I fancy myself slightly as a as an amateur astronomy astronomer. I don't recall ever seeing this galaxy <laughs> that's on the cover. <laughs> the question mark galaxy. You yeah, didn't know about yeah, that yeah. One? Where where is that located exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually um, an artistic distortion of the galaxy Messier fifty one M fifty one. Oh yeah. And that one was imaged by Hubble in very great detail. And sufficient detail that, um, and it's it's a spiral galaxy, so it already has sort of curves in it, 
and the uh, the the book designers at National Geographic, you know, they take book design very seriously. Yeah. I mean, you you don't pick up a National Geographic published book unless it 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 feels like it's it's talking to you not only in words but in images. And so, um, so they proposed that and I thought it was a brilliant idea. And so we ran with it. And so there it is, the question mark nebula. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, I thought I'd dive into, um, this conversation by channeling my inner Donald Rumsfeld from his famous 2002 press briefing, where he said, there are known knowns. There are things we know, we know. We also know that there are unknown, no, unknown, known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And uh, I thought your image here at the back, toward the end of the book here, of the um, of the jar of jelly beans. Uh, for those listening to this, it's a big jar of mostly black jelly beans with a handful of colored jelly beans in there that represent the actual stuff we can see. And that mass of black jelly beans represents, well, dark energy, dark matter. This would be something like the known unknowns, right? I mean, we know there's something there. We just don't know what it is. What it is. Yeah, it's a no, the known unknowns. That's correct. Yeah. On a level that we can actually quantify it. I don't think it's been appreciated as much as it should be that we can quantify w how much we don't know about the universe in, in this way. So, so in the 4% that we do know, therein contains all the laws of physics and chemistry and the periodic table of elements and, and all the matter and energy and forces and all the things we know and love and are taught in school. Then there's the dark, what we call dark matter, and that is responsible for six times as much gravity in the universe as all of the rest of the matter that we have recognized. By the way, matter that we know and understand, I'm including black holes in that. So, mm. so dark matter is really misnamed. It should be called dark gravity. Mm. All right? That is literally what it is. It is gravity with no known source. And then on top of that, there's this mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space making the universe accelerate. And we can measure that. We don't know what it is. So add up dark matter, dark energy is 96% of what is driving this universe. And we don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So really happy standing flat footed telling you that. <laughs> so what you're looking for is an explanation for two things. One, what holds galaxies together? They're rotating at a rate that uh, they would fly apart if it was, uh, if they consisted of just the matter we can see and measure. And then the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate, which it shouldn't be based on the amount of matter we know. So there's got to be something else out there. Is that basically it? Yeah, based on the amount of gravity that we know, that's correct. So something is is resisting the the natural tendency of all the matter and even dark matter to coalesce gravitationally. So so yeah, th those would be known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Those are kind of fun. The way I'd like to think about those is, um, this is a book, by the way, uh, Cosmic Query is a spinoff of, of my podcast, Star Talk. There's a, there's a format in it. In fact, you have participated in one of those <laughs> yeah. Cosmic Query spinoffs. Um, that was uh, all on skepticism. And I was delighted to have you as a guest on there as the, as the, the prime mover of all skeptical thinking in the world that you are <laughs> <laughs> prime mover i'm and, the prime mover <laughs> the first cause that's what i'm saying you're the <laughs> no, that's what i'm saying you are the prime mover of all the skepticism of the world so to have you on the show just to sort of anchor that um so that others can really know and understand what it means to be skeptical mm -hmm. um and you've got that all laid out in all your books and everything so we were delighted to have you as part of our cosmic queries and but what happens is Cosmic Queries, occasionally we get answers, excuse me, we get questions from our fan base that don't lend themselves to a simple podcast format. Like, mm. where did it all come from? How mm -hmm. is it all going to end? What is my place in the universe? And so those we lifted up into the form of the book. And so the book is not conceived and written because we had answers to the questions. Mm. It's conceived and written because these were questions people were asking. And some of them we have tidy answers for. Others, the answer's a little little ratty, a little, little incomplete. And other questions, we don't even know 
if they're the right questions to mm. ask. Mm -hmm. And that would come under the category of unknown unknowns. Yeah. What about uh, people that say something like, well, how do you know that there isn't some uh, additional force or dimension or some unknown known that unknown known that we will someday know and that'll explain whatever consciousness or psychic power yeah. or whatever sure except um let me give an example here uh if we go back in to the time of faraday so let's go back maybe is that 170 years or so so michael faraday a physicist in the uk who it was marvelous in his efforts to experiment with electricity and magnetism and in fact by then i don't think electromagnetism was a concept yet mm -hmm. they were still viewed as separate entities and um but it wasn't much after then that we came to that realization but so consider this he did a tabletop experiment right you can take a wire and he passed it through a magnetic field then he had a little meter on the side and the meter jumped every time he did that. And so what's curious is you do something over here and then something happens over there of, for no, un, for, with no known understanding of it. That's a mystery to be solved. Right. Okay. Now, just to be, just to be careful, get someone else to do it <laughs> just right. in case he's influencing it some way or uh, so you get a colleague, they do it and it did exactly the same thing. So you have a real phenomenon where you have sort of action at a distance, whatever, that no one has an explanation for. Therein were the seeds for our understanding of electromagnetism, which is a, an entire force of nature. My point is, if there were lingering, unexplained forces shaping our lives, there would be things happening mm -hmm. repeatedly around us that would still be a mystery. So I'm going to make a bold statement that tabletop physics is done. <laughs> okay. okay. There's no experiment you're going to do on a tabletop. We say, gosh, gee, that's a big mystery to, add the, to all the, no, no, we're past that. So, and this, this is the problem with the telekinesis and all of these other sort of, um, they're not entirely repeatable, you know? And so if it's not repeatable, it's not sort of useful as a, to harness, all right? Whereas all these other things I'm describing about were completely repeatable every single time you did mm, it. Mm. So now we're walking around. Is there something moving and we don't understand why? No. Is there something uh, transforming, mm. transfiguring, and we don't understand why? No. Okay? So to say that there's something could happen in our terrestrial lives that we will discover that will transform how we understand our terrestrial lives I'm, I'm not convinced of that. So the mysteries are on scales of size and energy that are far beyond our life experience. Like dark matter and dark energy manifesting on the largest scales of the universe. So if, if we learn what they are and figure out that they might affect us, I don't know what it is we would need it to explain. All right, because right, we got we, right. we have an understanding of everything else around us. Yeah, it's perfectly That's my put. long... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your, your in, in other words, there's nothing that needs explaining. This is the point I make about like when physicists or scientists talk about astrology and they go, well, the doctor standing next to you, I think Carl Sagan made this point, you know, has more gravitational force than Jupiter on you, something like that. But but there's nothing. Yeah, the, the obstetrician who delivered. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But but there's really nothing to explain because astrologers can't do what they say they can do. So we don't need to invoke the laws of physics to show that it can't work. That it can't work because there's nothing that actually needs explaining. And uh, so when we use the words like dark energy, dark matter, these are, uh, this is how I can, can conceive of it. These are linguistic placeholders until we can figure out what's actually going on. It turns out it's neutrinos or brown holes or dark, dark black holes or whatever. It, it ends up explaining it. Um, but, but, but see, like paranormalists will say something, well, it's, that's the paranormal. That's a force something like that. It's like, no, that's a, you're just using that word, paranormal. That's just a linguistic placeholder for something that actually doesn't need explaining. Your point is that dark energy, dark matter, we're just using these words as a placeholder until we figure out what it is because we still need to figure out something because there's actual measurable effects that we don't have an explanation for. And I distinguish dark matter, dark energy from the ether. 
Mm. So I have a fair amount of literature on the ether, this hypothesized medium perme yeah. permeating yeah. all of space yeah. that permitted light to be transmitted through it. A rather natural line of thinking, given that light was a wave, sound is a wave, sound needs a medium. If you had a ringing bell and put it inside of a glass jar and evacuated the air, the, the bell becomes silent. There's no way for its vibrations to reach you if there are no air molecules to transmit it. So this was a very natural expectation of nature, and no experiment ever detected. Oh, yeah, you got the that beautiful photograph of the uh, interferometer there. Yeah, try, trying to measure it. Yeah, the interferometer. Very nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so if so, it was it was supposed as a thing that filled space, and people went through all of the physics of what properties it must have to transmit light in a way that doesn't interfere with the light, such as how we measure starlight that has passed through it. So, so, so there was a whole literature on it, but there were no experiments showing it, and so. That's the difference. The difference is we, we, we presumed there was an ether. There was never an experiment to show it was there, and an experiment was ultimately conceived to demonstrate we don't need an ether. Dark matter, dark energy, we measure their existence. And it is a, there's a long, fascinating history in the physical sciences, astronomy in particular, where we measure things that we don't understand. We were measuring stellar spectra before we had a clue what spectra meant. <laughs> but we knew it was something there to, to, to take pictures of and to measure the size of the spectral features. And, and we, we had good data, even though we didn't know what it was we were documenting. Yeah. So I want to make that distinction. It's a very important one that isn't always um, uh, embraced when people have this conversation. Right, so the luminiferous ether doesn't exist. But then when I got to this part in your book about the gravitational waves and you got this illustration of what, you know, two neutron stars rotating around each other generating these waves might look like if you could visualize them, what are the waves waving in if there's nothing there? Oh, yeah, so there's no matter. There's no physical matter. So... These, so <laughs> um, this, is, this is what led to what I think is more semantic than real, mm. the debate about whether gravity is actually a force, mm. okay? So when we think of forces, we think of sort of an action at a distance, electromagnetic force, you know, that sort of thing. And gravity under Einstein is simply, dare I use the word in that context, <laughs> is simply... <laughs> matter responding to the curvature of space and time. Mm. If that's all you're doing, do you get to call it a force? Mm. If you're just skateboarding up and down these hills uh, in the skate park, um, are you, are you, is this some force that's guiding you? Or you, you, or you, you had to take that path. Mm. You had no other choice because that is the path of the terrain in which you are moving. So, so my point is, once you embrace the, the fact that gravity is better represented by a curvature in the fabric of space and time, as was it Einstein who first said, gravity tells matter how to move, and matter t no, um, space tells matter how to move, matter tells space how to curve, right? Mm, mm. And, so, and the word gravity is not even in that phrase. So, but so... Once you recognize this, that space-time continuum is, a, is a, itself a medium, if you want to think about it that way, then gravitational waves are waves in the medium of space and time, mm. not a medium in a thing that's in the space and time. And that's the difference. So this is way around that redundancy of, you know, what is gravity? It's the tendency of objects to attract one another. Why do objects attract one another? Because of gravity. <laughs> Well, I'm, I would, I'm happy to say, and you've probably gotten into these arguments before, where people, um, they'll ask how or why, and just keep asking until you have to say, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> and then they're not happy with that.
But I would say that that's a little bit of a ruse. Is that the mm -hmm. right word there? Ruse. Because, um, you know, because you get people say, science can say how things happen, but you need religion to say why. Mm -hmm. You know, the how and the why yeah, yeah, yeah. dichotomy. And I don't think those two words are as dichotomous mm -hmm. as people want to make them. I think they want to make them dichotomous so that they can have an argument, a philosophical argument. And I think that's, it's not fruitful because I, I can completely describe how an object will behave under the influence of gravity to the point where I can build machines. I can fly to Mars. I can go to the moon. I can do all of these things. And now you want to say, well, why? Because I can say, well, why does the object fall from the shelf when it's pushed off the ledge? Well, there's a force of gravity that pulls it and it accelerates it and that energy is recovered and it breaks the glass when it falls. Okay. That's, that's why it fell. But uh, you're not happy with that explanation. Mm -hmm. You want, you want to somehow imbue the behavior of the universe with some kind of purpose, mm -hmm. like meaning. Telos. What is the meaning of the glass falling? I, I can't, you know, go ahead and have that conversation, but I, I'm not going to engage that because I don't find it to be useful for the advance of our understanding of the operations of nature. Yeah. And I think explaining that gravity pulled the glass to the ground is a legitimate why did it fall? The answer to why did it fall? And yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, Thomas Nagel called this uh, one thought too many. You know, you just keep asking and asking and asking. You, at some point, you got to you. You just have to start the causal chain somewhere, <laughs> which I like. One thought. Too well, it's many. like you know, why do you use reason? Uh, you have faith in reason. What What's the purpose of reason? Stop. Reason is just a tool we use to answer questions. That's one thought too many. Is how we put it. Right. Um, but you know, so right, okay, right. And now that you mention it, uh, the why question is good if there is an actual mystery. Of, to what it is that you're describing. Hmm. But if I can completely describe the falling of the glass and the breaking of the glass, I'm done with the questions about the glass. <laughs> if you want to, you know, so I, I, I like that one, one, was it one question too many? No, one is thought too many, one thought too many, Thomas Nagel, one thought too many. One yeah. thought too many. Yeah. 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 That's you know, philosophers traffic mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, thought experiments, as you know, and sometimes they just take it as far as they can just to see how far they can go. And and sometimes that bumps into mm. this, you know, one thought too many. Like consciousness, you know, there's this, you know, the hard problem of consciousness. It could be, you know, it's just uh, it's just a feature of the universe full stop. I mean, the, we may not get the perfect explanation for uh, the question of does your red look like my red as if the homunculus in my brain can jump into yours and look into your Cartesian theater to see on your screen if the red looks like it does in me. You know, th these are kind of conceptual problems. That is problems with our concepts about consciousness and self and, and so on. This may be one of those, you know, we're just overthinking it. It's just, it just, it's a feature of the universe, something like that. Um, yeah. It's like the people who want to know whether a molecule of water can be, can still be considered mm, water. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I, again, I don't like, having arguments about how we define words just um I, I don't think i don't find it as productive as others do yeah um if water is wet and it's macroscopic can one molecule be wet i, I guess not did that mean <laughs> yeah. it's no longer water yeah uh how did you define water and so I, I don't the moment we argue over the definition of a word I would say, let's find a word we can agree on and then continue and move the conversation on, yes. from there. Yeah, mathematicians yeah. have this uh, problem called, the, well, the, colloquially, it's called the, the problem of the heap. How many grains of sand does it take to make a heap of sand? You know, one? No. If I, <laughs> add, if I add one grain to the first grain, is that a heap? No. Okay, we've established that adding a grain does not make a heap. So if I have 9,999 grains and I add one more grain, is that a heap? No, because we've already established. And this just goes on and on until at some point you're on top of this mountain going, it's still not a heap. <laughs> 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 but at some point, as you said, you know, we got to talk. There's another one, which I think is a, a, a little more legitimate than that, would be what is the smallest whole number digit, the whole, smallest whole number that has no interesting properties to it. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. So for example, the number one, it's like, it's just one that's, that's special. Two is the only even 
prime number. You're not going to break out into three okay. dog night. Uh, one is the loneliest number, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Was that three dog night? Okay, I yeah. forgot about that. <laughs> um, you keep doing this, and then you get uh, uh, six. Okay, that's the sum of one plus two plus three, which are each factors in it. And you start, and then you finally find the number that is the smallest number that has no interesting mathematical features about it. And that fact alone makes the number interesting. <laughs> and then what do we do with that? <laughs> well, what's what I'm saying? We, have so, a, we, we go out know, for a drink if, and, if and, and talk book, about something what else. What is the title of this book? <laughs> Cosmic Query. What is the title of the book? What is the title of the book, gotta, right? Have a, <laughs> Yeah, half hour conversation just <laughs> understanding the title. <laughs> uh, now, just one more po point on this gravitational thing. Um, you often see Einstein's uh, concept illustrated with you know the big bowling ball and a sheet of rubber, and that the the marbles are going around it not because of a force but because they're falling toward it because of the bending of space time. And that sheet would is too simplified because the sheet would be in every direction and so forth. But when I say take your book and I drop it. It doesn't feel like when it's falling toward my lap that it's falling around the sun like the earth goes around the sun, falling through this rubber sheet kind of thing. Maybe maybe the so, metaphor doesn't okay, what's work. What's missing in that analogy, yeah. which is why I don't think you see that analogy much lately. Mm. Um, it's sort of worn out its welcome. So the the way to think of that is the curvature made by the bowling ball is the path along space-time that light would take. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so the light is, is, the, is the path of the light is the indicator of the literal curvature of the space-time in the vicinity of the mass. If you go any slower than the speed of light, your path will be different, and that path, while still on the curvature of space and time, you cannot use that path to tell you what that curvature of space and time is. Mm. It's the speed of light that does it, mm. not the, the simple ball bearing I that tossed into I motion to go, to, to go around. So, so it's helpful to realize that it's following a path that's there, but it's not helpful to map the actual curvature of the space and time that you get from Einstein's equations. Got it. All right, continuing our known knowns and known unknowns and so forth, uh, let's hit the big questions you talk about in the book. Why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, so, just a little. Uh, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's start. Let's just, just, just jump in. Yeah, you don't want to ask something easy. You just, <laughs> um, I don't know that we have a good answer for it, hmm. but we, have, we can address that question in the following way. Um, all evidence points to the fact that the universe has zero total energy associated with it. And geometrically, that's a universe that's flat, as opposed to a universe that would curve back on itself or have a different curvature, what we call a saddle curvature, they would be negatively curved, you know, positively curved, negatively curved, that we're flat. And if you're flat, that tells you you have zero net total energy. You see, what do you mean? We have stars and, and, and people and, and, and all the rest of this. Well, without physics, it makes it a little harder to explain this, but it's possible to have negative energy. Hmm. Negative energy. And... So all you have to have is enough places that have negative energy to balance out the places that have positive energy so that if you mashed it all together, you recover the zero total energy of the system. Mm. And I, the best analogy I could find is, let's, let's say you have a field. Let's just say your backyard, and let's say it's flat. All right, now let's say you go back and sort of dig. And you dig, and now you make a mound of dirt. And you step back and say, wait, there's a mound of dirt there. Okay, well, that's amazing. Where did that mound of dirt come from? Oh, you took it out of the ground. Okay, <laughs> so, so the ground is missing soil, and now there's soil on top of the ground adjacent to it. 
the sum of those two is zero. Mm. And it turns out the universe has an interesting way of creating pockets of positive energy and negative energy spontaneously, right? Quantum physics can do this. And, and, and gravitation can also do that. And so when you do that, that's simply a further manifestation of zero total energy. So it's possible to have an entire universe of things we care about, provided you live in all the places where mm. the positive energy matters to you, and still have the whole universe have zero total energy. So you're making a universe with starting with no energy, because it continues to have no energy. Mm. And like I said, the mound of dirt with the hole in the ground is, that's sort of the closest sort of uh, terrestrial analog I can give to that. I wonder if maybe this is one of those one thought too many that it's not even the right question. Maybe that it'd be easier to say, why should there be nothing when something is the natural state of things? Yeah, but except the fact, okay. So rather than uh, something rather than nothing, I'm saying you're getting the something mm. from the places where there is the absence of something. Mm. which when they come together, you get zero. So I don't know. Is this the same question you just asked? Maybe. Or is it... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, See, I hear, hear, so, hear yeah. some, sometimes I think we hit an epistemological wall where we don't, maybe don't have the right concepts or words to, to, to describe what it is we're confused oh, yeah, by about. By the way, with consciousness, which you mentioned a moment ago, I wonder if the very question about our consciousness is the right question. Mm-hmm. We're assuming such a thing as consciousness exists, and now we're we're burning uh, books, try, not burning literally, but we're 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 uh, laying words to page of many many a book trying to explain this thing mm -hmm. that we have given meaning to by assigning it a word, mm -hmm. reifies it, right? So, yeah. So once it has a word, now we have to explain the word. Well, maybe it's the wrong question. I just contemplating that. No, I, I think that myself. I think that's probably right. It feels like there's something floating around in my head called we and we call them thoughts and and sentience and consciousness and and the moment you put a word on it, it's like well then it has a separate existence from the neurons in my brain. But of course it doesn't. It can't. It's just it's just right. electric meat up there. So uh, whatever it's doing, it has to be a product of that. Uh, have, right now that everyone has a high resolution video camera on their hip there are many more videos on the internet of animals pets and other sort of uh familiar animals doing things while no one is looking mm -hmm. okay because if there's an animal and you're chasing after it and picking it up and feeding it it's doing things that it's responding to you so what do these animals do when no one is looking there's a video of a tortoise that walks up to a ball in a driveway and it takes his head and knocks the ball because it doesn't have hands, right? Not, not movable. It's, it's got to stand up on all four. It takes his, it's, it's flexible neck and head and nudges the ball and it watches the ball roll. And then it walks up to the ball and then continues it. <laughs> it's, it's playing ball with itself. Mm. And I thought to myself, this is, it's, and it's not even a mammal, right? It's, it's a tortoise. So, uh, is it, are we thinking that it is having fun? Mm -hmm. It has its own sense of entertainment. Will we deny it a consciousness just because we like putting ourselves as humans on some pedestal, like we're some kind of pinnacle of, of evolution. And so, so, and there's another one where bear is walking down the street by itself, it's on, it, it climbed up to a highway. It looks like a, a black bear. And there's a, a traffic cone that has, is tipped over. It comes up to the traffic cone, looks at it, it writes the cone, <laughs> checks it out, and then keeps walking. And it's like, what the fuck, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, you never otherwise see animals yeah. doing this, all right? Yeah. The bear is hungry and wants to eat you, or you're chasing the bear, and now it is just minding its own business. And so, um, we keep wanting to think that we have something special in what we're calling consciousness. And maybe it's just a natural expression of what it is to be alive. And I, I, I don't know. So I'm just saying maybe it's not the right question. Yeah. Like with Pinocchio, 
there's an example of not the right question. Right? Mm. It's in the book too. It's like if Pinocchio utters the following sentence, my nose is about to grow. Then you can ask what happens next? Okay, Michael, what happens next? <laughs> the nose grows. <laughs> he tells but a then lie. He'd be telling the truth. <laughs> Oh, I see. It's he'd a, then be telling the truth. Right. Yes, it's a word trap. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a word trap. Okay. So we can call it a word trap, but that trivializes it. Mm -hmm. It's actually a sentence that has no meaning in Pinocchio's universe. It's a sentence he would never utter and would never think to utter. There would be no neurology in him to utter that sentence mm. because it's illegal in his universe. Mm. For such a sentence to exist, I don't call it illegal, but it's just, it makes no sense to anybody. In the same way on this earth, you ask Santa Claus, which way is north? Every direction Santa points is due south. So it, the question, which way is north, has no meaning mm. in the universe that is earth's surface. So, so, and we can, we can tell that it has no meaning because we already come from, we can come from the other side because we know the answer to it. But if you don't know the answer in advance, you are posing questions that could have positively no meaning at all would that in the be like realm in which you were trying to explore it, it like asking what was there before the big bang is like asking what's north of the north pole cuz you're asking what was there before well, time well i don't think we know enough about before the big bang to assert that it's that same kind of question mm -hmm. but it could be mm -hmm. yeah that's correct yeah maybe the question has no meaning but i happen to know for sure, <laughs> there is nothing north of the North Pole because that's the geometry of what it yeah. is. To say what is before the Big Bang, and if that's where time began, um, then uh, if you're certain that's where time began, then okay, I'll take the answer. But I don't think you're that certain. Hmm. In fact, that answer was given before we had a fully developed multiverse theory. And so you, the multiverse predates the beginning of your Big Bang. Hmm. Then there's some meta clock. Why, why limit yourself to the clock of your universe? Who's to say yours is the clock of record? Yours is just one of an infinite number of clocks. And then the master clock is the one that's controlling the, the, the multiverse itself. Mm. So what would be... So I don't want to stop you asking. Yep. Oh, no, no. Universe. No, no, no. The multiverse is great because it's a good uh, starting off point to, to some more questions of, um, is it possible that... Um, these other universes are there if we can never detect any energy from them then we're not really on the page of science anymore this is i don't know metaphysics or philosophy or something like that or could there be someday a way to test it like say gravitational waves leak from one of these other uh, universes into our own universe if the brains collide or something like that i'm sure i'm not using the right jargon there but is there it, 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 there has to be some way to test it or else what are we even talking about um, so that's an important question that, uh, I can give it a, a mildly unsatisfactory answer to you. And that is, we don't know if we will ever be able to interact with the other universe. And so because we don't know, there's nothing that should stop us from exploring what the properties of such a universe would be. For you to say, why do this if we will never interact with it? I'm not, I don't have that much confidence in our future discoveries to say we will never interact with it. I, I don't. Uh, you don't want to sound like, was it Auguste Comte? Was it he who said, like, right at the doorsteps of the birth of spectroscopy, which made it especially embarrassing for him, where you say, the stars, they're so beautiful. I'm paraphrasing. They're so beautiful. It's too bad we will never know <laughs> what they're made of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know where they are in the sky. We know what color they are. But their actual constituency, uh, uh, constituent parts, it's forever denied us. Right. And then within minutes, spectroscopy <laughs> lands in physics and chemistry. And yeah, we know exactly what the stars are made of. So you don't want to be caught. Mm -hmm. stating but uh, since we'll never be able to interact with that universe why are we even caring that it's there is it really science so i'm perfectly content to follow the theoretical constructs that tell us that there's another universe or a multiverse 
on the possibility that one day we figure out how to interact with him. Yeah. And so I say, push on. And by the way, they're not very expensive. You know, you give these people a, a, a laptop, a pad and pencil. <laughs> 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 the people thinking about multiverses are not, you know, lobbying for particle accelerators, for expensive <laughs> equipment. Yeah. To think that through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even before, uh, August Comte, uh, Emmanuel Kant made the, the statement that the two great mysteries in, of the world are the starry heavens above and the moral law within. So we have the starry heavens above figured out, and I think we're getting a pretty good handle on the moral law within. So what place then for God? So the theologian might respond to you, Neil. Oh, by the way, wait, one thing about the moral law. Wait, yeah. I just have, I don't know why this continues without the, the, the critique I'm going to hand you right now. People are saying, often religious people will say that the, the morality of God is writ into our souls, all mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I don't mind anybody saying that, except, you know, why do we have, you know, millions of people in prison, right? I mean, so, so, so you can say if someone has a morality that we all agree with, and you, you can credit God for that, but how about the person who just, you know, dismembered their loved ones and ate them and stored them in the freezer, they coexist in this same world mm -hmm. as the person who knows that that's the wrong thing to do. So the people who don't know that these are the wrong things to do and do it for spite or because they're, what is the word, uh, sociopaths, um, who are you to say that this moral code is written in all, written in all of our hearts? Mm. Who are you to say? We, we fought two world wars where 70, 80 million people were slaughtered. Who, what, is it, what does it mean to say, humans, we have a moral code writ within us? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Yeah. In the face of the evidence of the bad people that exist in the world. Yeah. And the bad people are judged by those who are uh, setting the rules for what is morality and what isn't. Yeah. Here's what I think about that. Um, certainly there are psychopaths, maybe 1% to 3% of males, 1% of females. The vast majority of them are not violent and 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 killers and and and, and so forth. They're they're running uh, big companies. They're on Wall Street trading. You know, they're highly competitive athletes. They are members of the Navy SEALs. They're fearless and so on. Most of the traits that we associate with psychopathy are are negative, but in fact, they're positive traits. So that said, um, you know, the law deals with this in the in terms of you know, the famous McNaughton law, that if you don't know the difference between right and wrong, then you can plead insanity because you didn't know that this was wrong. Okay, that that plea almost never works because most people are not so impaired that they have no uh, sense of right and wrong. In 2005, the Supreme Court dis, uh, determined that uh, the death penalty cannot be imposed on anyone under the age of 18 because all the scientific evidence shows that in t until your 20s, your prefrontal cortex is not online enough to uh, control your bubbling up urges. And so you can't vote, you can't own a rifle, you can't drink, you can't go to war and so on. And so uh, we sh we really, for good reasons, and so we, we shouldn't be able to hold you accountable. I think what, um, what, what moral philosophers mean when they say we have a moral law within is that most of us, with a handful of exceptions of the you know extreme serial killers or whatever, most of us have a sense of right and wrong that comes from our evolutionary history as social primates in which we have to figure out a way to get along uh, with the other um, selfish primates that you know are, are running through the same calculations we're running through. I want what's best for me, but I know that you want what's best for you and yours, so I need to appeal to you uh, in order for you to treat me nice. I can't just say you should be nice to me because I'm me and you're not. That's not going to appeal to you, so I have to appeal to your good sense and, and, and of right and wrong and, and vice versa. So you end up in a game theoretic model in which we have something like reciprocal altruism and prosociality and cooperation and so on, the violations of which then are punished uh, by social groups of shunning and gossip all the way to imprisonment. Yeah, and my point is, if it was genuinely written in our hearts and souls, there would never be an occasion to punish someone for violating it. Be because you would have no motivation to violate it because it's writ oh, large not, in your soul. Yes, I see what you and mean, right. So this 1%, right, 2% right. psychopath number you're offering, if you're in a candy store and there's a Snickers bar there and you, someone told you, 
you could steal the Snickers bar and no one will know and there'll be no consequences to it. And you happen to be hungry and whatever. And so you could just slip it in your pocket and do it. What fraction of the public would do that? I would say at least 50% would, would take the Snickers bar. At least 50. All right. So whatever moral code is or should exist, it's not preventing the bad behavior. So if it's not preventing the bad behavior, why, what, is the, what, is the, what does it mean to even talk about it? Mm. Well, Bob Trivers answers it this way. That is to say, we care about our reputations uh, with other people of doing the right thing. And uh, so, so why would you tip? At, at a restaurant, well, because your you know fellow dinner mates there can see you tipping, and you have a reputation of being a generous person. <laughs> well, what if I'm on the road traveling and I'm dining by myself? Why would I bother to tip? I'm never going to see this person again. But you do it because, it, well, you know, you do it because it feels good to be nice. But why does it feel good to be nice? Well, in part, this is what Trivers argues that you're better convincing your fellow tribe mates. <laughs> that you're a good moral person by actually being a moral person because you act it and you feel it and you can sell it better if you actually do it rather than pretending to do it in a utilitarian uh, Machiavellian way. And because your, your group mates are going to detect that you're kind of a manipulative asshole and we know you don't really mean it. But if you actually do it and live it, then you take on those characteristics of being a genuinely good moral person and then we trust you more. There's an episode of Seinfeld where they, um, there was the, it wasn't quite the morality of tipping, but it was the tactics of tip, tipping. Mm. Like you, you don't want to put the money in the tip jar unless they see you yeah. do it. George Costanza, <laughs> so like, that, like get, I remember that. You get the credit for, <laughs> right. The, the guy right. turned at the last and moment so that he, whole, he put it in there, then he reached in <laughs> to get it back out. And then the guy turns around and sees him pulling the money out of the jar. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, if I'm good, not because it's written in my soul, be because I fear retribution or I fear prison, then that's not an authentic goodness. And so I, I'm, I'm just not convinced that anyone is good because it's 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 fundamentally part of our DNA. I'm, I'm not I'm not prepared to accept that. If it was really part of our DNA. There would be no prisons. So it's not part of our DNA. Right. But what's part and of our uh, the prisons are just people who got caught. There's the people who who still transgressed, got away with it, and will keep getting away with it until they get caught, maybe. So anyway, I just had to put that out there. Yeah, yeah, I, no, you know, no. To it's, say, it's, it's what a, keeps us behaving well? Prison, the threat of prison <laughs> keeps you in line. Yes. But but for most of us, that isn't our day-to-day -day activity. We don't, we're not nice to our spouses or our friends or colleagues, or, or, or we don't, you know, not do nasty things to our workmates because we think we're going to get thrown in prison. That's pretty far down the line. We fear reputation, uh, harm. People are going to gossip about me if I'm, you know, an asshole you know, and so on. And I, I don't want people thinking about me that way because I, I care I'm getting, about I guess reputation. what I, I'm arguing against the religious argument. You're giving the, you're giving the rationalized argument. I have no argument with your argument. Uh, just for us to believe that it is writ in the soul of us all, mm -hmm. that is something natural. Um, I don't know. If it could be so easily overcome or so easily uh, if you're doing it for completely selfish reasons then it's not really writ in your heart if, yeah, if i'm nice yeah. to my coworkers because i don't want them to think badly of me that's a completely selfish reason it's not completely native within me to be nice yeah if it was completely native within me i wouldn't worry or think or care what anyone thinks about having uh, you know uh, about what i've done i wouldn't care if the server saw me or not put the money in the tip jar, mixed with everyone else's money. I wouldn't care because that would just be fundamental to me. Mm -hmm. And we know that's not true. Yeah. Um, many, if not most people. That's all. I didn't yeah, mean no, to derail no, no. the that's, conversation. That's right. Yeah, no, no, this is, all, this is all gold. I mean, we have inner demons and better angels. And the whole point of civilization is to tilt the matrix of reward and punishments in a way to get most people to do the right thing most of the time. But you got to have police most and prisons time, yeah. and military. And so you need those things, right? Right. You know, this is kind of the point conservatives make. You know, we can't let social structure break down too much. Uh, you know, we need, don't defund the police. We need police because, you know, people are not always nice. And, you know, so when the theologian or the Christian says, uh, well, you know, you have to have God to be good. Well, hang on. Isn't it, w wouldn't you rather be good for goodness sake rather than for God's sake in some you know, kind of basic cosmic right. courthouse where it's all going to be settled in the next life? 
Uh, wouldn't it be better to, right. to uh, yeah, here I'm agreeing with you, wouldn't it be better to be good for goodness sake here and now rather than being rewarded in some afterlife? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I accept your apology there. No, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, let's continue. I mean, this, uh, uh, oh, the other thing I loved about your book, Neil, is all your, uh, tweets that you have in there. Cause you're one of the best tweeters, oh. uh, one of the best tweeters on the tweet, tweetosphere. Uh, cause you don't, first of all, you don't get engaged in all these crazy wars, uh, of, uh, you know, canceling each other and all this stuff, which is so negative. Uh, but yours are very effective. I mean, I, uh, yeah, every, every page, almost every page has one of your, uh, you know, here's one here. I'll no, read. you got to go. You got to earn at least a few pages of reading to get to the one of the tweets. You got to go at least a couple of pages. Yeah, well, th- this is the theme of the book here. When contemplating the cosmos, we don't always know all that we don't know. So for me, I yearn for the questions I don't yet know to ask. That's where we were, where I got the idea of introducing the unknown unknowns. Oh, and then um, here with a picture of Stonehenge, you have just because you can't figure out how ancient civilizations built stuff doesn't mean they got help from the aliens, <laughs> which I really like because, you know, we call that the, uh, you know, the pyramidians, you know, the people that can't figure out how the pyramids were built. You know, it's just a pile of stones, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> it kind of sells short the, the Egyptians, you know, they had a lot of free labor or cheap labor and a lot of time and it never rains so they could work every day. <laughs> but I did want to ask you about um, what your thoughts are on archaeoastronomy. You know, our mutual friend Ed Krupp at the Griffith Observatory, this is one of his specialties. You know, you go into one of these um, archaeological finds in, you know, in the desert, and there's you know images on the rocks inside some cave. And, you know, they were carved thousands of years ago, and the modern astronomer goes in there and goes, okay, I think this is the equatorial plane, and I think that represents Jupiter and so on. But 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 do you ever worry about like maybe we're imposing modern concepts onto what could just be doodlings or something? How do you think about that idea? Yeah, yeah, that, there's that risk, of course. Um, yeah, it could be just <laughs> doodling, doodling. People not paying attention in their schoolroom class in the cave, yeah, yeah. and they're just <laughs> doodling on the wall. Uh, so I think you're allowed to give the civilization that you're investigating the benefit of the doubt. Mm. All right. I think you're give them the intellect you would expect of yourself. If you were imagining you were viewing your own sort of family lineage that went back and say, let's say they are curious about the night sky. Let's say they are curious about if that were the case, what could be shown here? And because we have computer models of uh, you, can, you can run the clock back where all the sun, moon, stars, and planets were going back tens, hundreds, thousands, even millions of years. We can do this. You can ask, well, when was, you can ask the archaeologists, when was this civilization active in this region where they were in this cave? They'll give you a time frame. Then you can look in your notes and say, is there anything in that time frame that happened cosmically that would be so interesting or so different? that someone might want to take note of it. Hmm. So you go ahead and do that. And you say, oh my gosh, a star blew up. Hmm. It was visible not only in the night, but in the daytime. Oh my gosh. And on this cave wall, there's this star in the sky. And by the way, on other cave walls that were drawn at a time that doesn't coincide with the same period, there is no star. So I think there are ways of sort of triangulating back to get evidence of the the of the record keeping mm. of the night sky, because the, the night sky, as we say, is above all of our heads. And it, and everyone has historically has seemed to react to them. Even if you go back to the earliest of civilizations that have some hint of themselves today, such as the Australian Aborigines in their artwork, the Pleiades show up all the time in their artwork. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in their drawing, in their, um, um, stories, and so this is a cluster of stars in the sky, um, and uh, it's visible. Uh, that's that's the southern hemisphere, so the Pleiades would be low. But it's an interesting collection of stars that are all sort of packed together in one little area. So, so I don't have a problem with that. And th- I've joked about it, by the way, just to, to put throw a bone back to where you were coming from. Um, the I, I found the days of the year where the sun sets precisely on the coordinate grid 
of Manhattan. <laughs> I know your Manhattan and, hinge. Uh, I, I love that. Manhattan hinge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I was very, I was delighted to learn that the OED lifted the word up, and it's now an official really? word in the OED. Oh, congratulations! Um, That's super. Yeah, cool. yeah, yes. Yeah. It's official. Thank you. My first and probably only word that'll. <laughs> I've used other words that don't exist anywhere, but no one caught on. So. <laughs> I've always admired um, you astronomers so, for your, your jargon. I mean, it's so simple and so elegant. Big bang, black hole, white dwarf, you know. Oh, yeah, we're there. You, you know, philosophers we're, and psychologists come up with these long strings of, you know, Latinish words, and people have no idea what it means. <laughs> no, and, and you got to explain the words before you even get to the idea, right? <laughs> right. So that's that, that, that quite the distraction when you're trying to be an educator. Uh, so, so with... So I joke about it. So I found what days they were. So they were happened twice. Happens around May twenty eighth, around there, and also July eleventh. And because the sunset point on the horizon moves sort of north of that, and then works its way back. Whoever thought that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, you were misinformed. Mm. It does that on only two days of the year. <laughs> the grid is rotated mm. from the compass. The, the the traditional compass directions. So you have to figure out what those days were. So I did that and published those dates. And now thousands of people flood the streets blocking traffic. I think it's great. <laughs> to block, if you're going to block New York traffic, at least let it be for a cosmic reason and not some construction or the, the electric company digging holes. So uh, uh, my point is that I thought about it and I said, Suppose in apocalyptic Earth, they dig up the Manhattan grid <laughs> and they treated it the way we treat ancient civilizations that we dig up. What might they say about us? They would say, oh, oh, they were clearly sun worshipers hmm. because <laughs> these, they've aligned, it aligns on these two days. Right. And so, all right. And what was special in their culture about these two days? Oh, okay. On May 28th, let's dig it up. That corresponds in the United States with Memorial Day <laughs> and July 11th, that is baseball's all-star break. <laughs> so this culture was about the sun, war, and baseball. <laughs> I just, just try to imagine. So these are anthropologists overstepping, right? Although that's not terribly inaccurate. <laughs> <and> effects of <laughs> what that's not a bad summary of so uh, I think American that history. Risk, uh, that risk that took place with Stonehenge. Stonehenge, yeah. before it was decoded as an astronomical observatory, people just thought they were ancients with, you know, uh, sun rituals and uh, dancing around the rocks and the rocks um, were, were decoded by a guy named Gerald Hawkins who noted that the number of holes that surround the stones and the number of stones can actually enable you to predict eclipses. Mm -hmm. And if you're not giving ancient, <coughs> if you're not giving ancient people the power of figuring things out, they were as human as we are. Mm -hmm with basically the same brain, they just had less technology than we have, but their capacity to figure things out was no different than today. And so, um, so once you allow that to be possible, I think you can open your, your discovery, um, paths to many things that you might've overlooked for them. Let's talk about, um, origins of life and, and extraterrestrial life. Uh, is directed panspermia or panspermia still discussed as a viable explanation for the origins of life on Earth, even though it just kicks the can down the road for you know how it started somewhere else in the first place? <coughs> right, it does kick the can. I happen to like the concept of panspermia. Oh, by the way, it got that word got touched up, and I forgot. I saw the, the, new, the new word for that only once, so forgive me for not remembering it. The, it became a word that is not genderized, mm. panspermia. Mm. Right? That's a genderized mm. the concept of, of a scientific concept. So just to catch people up, panspermia would be, imagine life forming on Mars before it formed on Earth. Mm -hmm. What we learned in recent years, computer simulations of asteroid impacts, that in a collision between an asteroid and a planet, it can send shock waves through the surrounding terrain of sufficient ferocity that it can fling rocks to escape velocity from that planet. So imagine a planet that's teeming with life, even if it's just microbial. You can imagine rocks that have nooks and crannies where stowaway microbes 
are in that rock as it gets cast out into space. Now, what happens next? Well, eventually these rocks will land on another planet. If you do the orbital mechanics of it, that's, that will happen. Uh, some rather quickly, others may take tens of thousands of years. All right, so now that rock makes it to Earth. Well, all right, wouldn't everything that was the stowaway be dead? Right? There's the vacuum of space, there's the high radiation, there's the low temperatures, there's the high temperature of the re-entry, or the, the first time entry, coming through the atmosphere. So you'd expect most life forms to just die. But if there was any variant of a microbe that could survive those conditions, then that microbe would be alive on arrival to Earth. Okay and thereby seeding life with, uh, on Earth with life that began on Mars. All right, so first we know that can happen because of orbital dynamics. Can life survive that? Well, that's it would be hard. So you can ask, is there any life on Earth that is that resistant to the radiation and the temperatures and getting freeze dried and heated and cooled? Yeah, there is. <laughs> it's called a tardigrade. Yeah, you got that tardigrade, tardigrade in here. Tardigrade bear is. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, we have a tardigrade in there. Tardigrade is a is is a uh, the common name for it is water bear. It's the cutest little thing you ever seen. It's microscopic, but it's almost impossible to kill the tardigrade. You can freeze dry it. You can radiate it. You can heat it. Cool it. You can you can do all these things, and you can say. Why would any life form? There he is. <laughs> by natural selection, isn't that the cutest thing ever? Yeah, and it's you even cute. have a tweet about uh, it that it would make a great uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade balloon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, by the way, the book was not written around the tweets. The, the tweets, <laughs> but we, I love the tweets. The it breaks it said, up. You no, know, on that topic. <laughs> So we mined my eight years, 10 years of tweeting and then put, put them in just as a reward for having gotten that far, little biscuits <laughs> along your route. Um, so there is no reason why any life form on Earth should be resistant to those conditions that do not happen here on Earth's surface. Mm. There's no reason to be able to be freeze dried on Earth's surface. There's, the conditions don't need that. So there'd be no natural selection to select for that. So why would a tardigrade be the only thing on Earth that can actually survive a space voyage? Unless, in fact, it was one of the survivors of a space voyage. Mm. And so the, the tardigrade becomes sort of the best modern example of what could have been the kind of life that, that uh, hitched a ride on a rock mm. from Mars or anywhere else. So that would be panspermia. And I, I, I'd like the idea. And it would mean that we'd probably have DNA such as what you find on Mars. Um, that would be a good and a bad result, I would say. I don't want to value judge it. It would be an interesting and an uninteresting result, right? So it would be interesting if we're all Martian descendants, mm -hmm. okay? That would, that would be a nice boost to the concept of panspermia. But it would be more interesting if we were not descendants of Martians. And we find that life on Mars still has DNA. That would mean you had a genesis on two planets. Mm -hmm. And DNA became a natural consequence of complex organic chemistry. That would be a more amazing mm -hmm. fact mm -hmm. than if one just derived from the other. Yeah. And I, I, something I heard from, I, might it have been a... a, a, a I'm sure it wasn't a biologist. I think it was a geologist. They just posed the question. They said, look, minerals on Earth are the same as minerals on other planets. Mm -hmm. They're in different ratios, of course, but iron oxide here is iron oxide on Mars. Silicon dioxide rocks and quartz are that. that. So, so rock chemistry is the same. Why wouldn't life chemistry be the same? And I just thought that was a profound reflection yeah. on what yeah. guidance for what our expectations might be. Although, as see, we look to for get, life on to, other to get to a self replicating molecule like DNA, you'd have to have something like RNA and then something like the pre RNA world that 
biochemists talk about happening here to get to RNA in the first place and then to DNA, that's a little more complex than than minerals. And I think it's Dawkins that makes the point um, for evolution to happen on some other planet. Yeah. yeah. To have evolution happen on some other planet, you need self-replicating molecules. They need not necessarily be the you know the double helix like ours. I guess there's other ways to configure it. Um, but this does bring up the question of of convergent evolution. Uh, Richard and I had a little debate a, a few years ago about this because I made a joke about uh, the aliens uh, in, in science fiction. They always are they're always bipedal primates with some gnarly stuff on their forehead and they speak English with a weird accent, right? So this is obviously not going to be the case. But on the other hand, um, and, and and I think Sagan always made the point that uh, you know that we shouldn't even envision what they look like because they're going to be so different from us that you know it's it's too anthropocentric to think of them as something like us. But Dawkins makes this point that convergent evolution would mean that you, you, if you're in if if you mostly live in the air, you have to have something like wings or a float bladder or something. If you're in the ocean, you need a, like a fusiform body that slips through the, the dense medium. If you're on land, you have to have something like arms and legs to move around, and then you have all your sensory equipment on I'm one end. A snake, but go on. Okay, the snake, snake was yeah. never held back by the absence of arms and legs. I just want to. I don't mean to jump in your face there, but go yeah, on. Yeah, okay, but there's all right. There's other. Okay, maybe. <laughs> all right, I stand corrected. Although uh, uh, in the evolution of snakes, didn't they have? Uh, aren't there some snakes with vestigial? Arms and legs, or at least legs, or something like that. Yes, it, yes. All yeah. snakes have vestigial yeah. spots right, there. Right. And they, they lost their, their arms yes, and legs. They lost. So they there is, yes, okay. they did. That's right. Okay. All right. I stand slightly corrected because most animals have but arms more, and legs. Know. Okay. So anyway, then he makes the point uh, again, you're going to have you know your, your sensory equipment and your brain on one end and the waste disposal system on the other end. And you could conceivably think of something like a bipedal, whatever, reptoid or insectoid or or primate of, of some kind because if we do discover extraterrestrials they're going to have to have been made tools if if they have technology so then you have to have free up your uh, one set of limbs for tool making and so forth and the other set of limbs for for moving and then all of a sudden you're talking about something that is not so different from us so anyway i just thought i'd get your thoughts on on to what extent if we <laughs> encounter extraterrestrial intelligence they'd be anything like us you just talked yourself into Hollywood aliens, <laughs> actors with I costumes. Know. I don't you like talked that. yourself into that. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I just, I look at the diversity of life on Earth, which is extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenotypically extraordinary. So the, is that right? Yeah, phenotypically extraordinary, not genotypically extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. We have very similar biochemistry to a banana it turns out but but what we look like is really different and so i'm just thinking life on another planet really should look more different from us than we and any other life form look like compared to each other here on earth that i'm just that's just i'm just putting it out there now you're saying if they visit us that's a different slice of their tree of life who has the power and the intellect and the tool building and all the rest of that. So maybe they do need hands or maybe they, or limbs of some kind. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, let me just say that um, there's a book, a charming book. It's called A Cosmotheria. Hmm. It's, it's something like that. And it's written by, um, what's this, his name? It's this Dutch polymath. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, forgive me for not having it at the tip of my tongue. So he wrote this book speculating on the planets, okay? He wrote this in, when was it, late 1600s, something like that. And it, he speculated. And so what did he say? He said, you know, um, Jupiter has clouds, clearly, because you can see, you, you see clouds through a telescope. And he said, well, if it has clouds, it must have weather. Well, if it has weather, it must have rain. Mm. If it has rain, it must have oceans. Mm. If it has oceans, it means any living beings there would want to navigate those oceans, so they would have ships. If they have ships and they have weather, then they must have sails. If they have sails, <laughs> they need a way to control the sails, so they would need rope. <laughs> 
And so these these so these <laughs> creatures on living on Jupiter surely grow hemp. <laughs> That's great. That's really funny. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm just saying, as you gave me that explanation, I'm thinking I'm thinking of this other explanation. Yes. Why Jovians grow hemp. <laughs> Too many causal uh, links in the in the chain there that uh, can, know, can go wrong in any one of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but 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 people that study this stuff, they do think about those things. Like, well, if they're going to have technology, they have to have energy from the sun, so they got to build solar panels. And before you know it, you have something like a Dyson sphere, and astronomers that are looking for the remnants of past civilizations. Uh, like Tabby Star, uh, in which you know there's objects that seem to be blocking the light more than a, a planet would. So therefore, you know, and you know the, the argument had people going for quite a few news cycles. Yeah. yeah. Yes. No. And and it's funny how the human yeah. mind leaps to you know those conclusions so rapidly. When when the Tabby Star story broke, uh, I was on a radio show here uh, in L.A. with uh, 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 Canon Julian. And, um, and, and so, and, and they had, uh, Art Bell, or not Art Bell, the other, uh, George Nuri on. The and, other guy. Yeah, the other guy. So yeah. Nuri is talking about, you know, I have good close contacts in NASA that tell me this is the first discovery of extraterrestrial, uh, debris from a civilization around Tabby Star, 1500 light years away. And, uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm just about to start my explanation and, and Julian jumps in and goes, well, well, what did they like? And I go, what is who like? The aliens. I'm like, oh. Oh my gosh! You know, they just go from you know there's a, an anomalous blip in the light uh, curve to what are the aliens actually like? <laughs> so it, well, that reminds me of the, the famous quote by Mark Twain: uh, the, "The the the curious thing about science, you gain such wholesale conjecture from a trifling investment of facts." <laughs> That's nice. Uh, so so the book is called Cosmotheros, and okay. written by just uh, verified it. Cosmotheros by Christian Huygens, oh, who's that, credited with many that Huygens. Oh yeah, wow, many brilliant things. And the book is dated 1698. So, yes, there so, it is. Um, I think we talked about this separately. Christian Huygens, uh, he was the one who first figured out the rings of Saturn correctly, right? Yes, he was to, yeah. to, to understand what they were rather than just what they look like. Right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we talked about that separately. Uh, to me, that's one of the more interesting um, moments in the history of science of why Galileo got Saturn wrong, even though he's always credited with getting all this other stuff right and uh, against the church. But in fact, he did not have a very good data uh, from Saturn because the telescope was small, and there was no concept of planetary rings. Uh, and so this is why, uh, again, back to the Rumsfeld known unknowns and all that business, you know, are, are there things in the cosmos that we just can't even conceive of to explain whatever the mystery is? The equivalent of Saturn's rings for Galileo. Yeah, so um, there's an interesting... Uh, so it depends how smart you are, right? So, so here's what I mean by that. Let's say there's something mysterious in the universe, and you know you're smart. Okay, and you try to figure it out, and you invoke all the known laws of physics and chemistry and biology and and everything. And you're smart. You're smarter than you were the top of your class. And you apply all of this, and you say it's none of these things. So therefore, it must be God, or it must be aliens, or it must be the end. Well, okay. Um, the problem was you were really smart. You were so smart, you would not allow the possibility that you just couldn't figure it out, mm. even by natural causes, mm. right? I mean, you can, you can smart yourself into a box and not believe that another explanation could possibly lay right out of your own reach. Mm. Or someone who's also smart, but is clever in a different way and would find then a more innovative or inventive solution to the problem at hand. So... Um, so what's out there, the unknown unknowns, that's hard, right? Cause you don't know what's unknown, mm -hmm. but, uh, th definitely dark matter, dark energy that mm -hmm. says un it's known unknowns, but th there's still so much unknown about even knowing them. <laughs> 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 uh, 
that they're the best example of just something lurking out there. I would love that once we figure out what they are, if they, it helped explain other unknowns, that, that's, those are the best unknowns uh, in the field of science. Like Einstein's relativity, general relativity, explaining the precession of Mercury's orbit. Hmm. He didn't start his day looking to explain that. That, that spilled off the table. Hmm. Mm. as a free explanation for things. Mm -hmm. And that's how you knew he was onto something. Yeah. Onto something deep. Well, those thought experiments. Well, so we don't know what's going on in the center of a black hole. Mm. Well, what's going on? We have no idea. Mm. Or in a singularity. Are there singularities? We, we have no idea. Don't know. I want to know. So the rub here is to find, uh, to keep a mind open enough to... Uh, be able to see the Saturn's rings, the things that we just can't even conceive of, and then all of a sudden they they pop in your mind, like Einstein envisioning riding on a beam of light or falling down an elevator shaft or two lightning bolts striking the ground at the same time. But if you're on a train traveling in the one direction, the one's going to hit before the other one. Something like that could happen in a century or a thousand years from now or something, and then you go, oh, okay. So you, you, you can't close that off, but on the other hand, you don't want to be so open-minded that you, you just believe every wacky idea that every other person comes up with six ideas before breakfast <laughs> of crazy ideas. Um, yeah. you know, so, how do you, so how do you exactly. think of that? It's the wacky index. Yeah, yeah. But you have to be careful because you often you don't know the depth of – you don't know how big – the small problem is hmm. all right. I think the most famous example of this was at 1895. And who was it? Who was asked this? Uh, was it Lord Kelvin? Yeah. He was still alive then. Oh, One that, of the, so the pompous, yeah, it was Kelvin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> One of the pompous physicists of the day. Um, when asked, uh, tell us about physics. Should we have new people enter this field? And he says, no, Everything is, is almost completely understood yeah. in the field of physics. This, this is not a field that has a future. Because, by the way, uh, uh, Einstein, um, um, Newton's uh, th uh, mo um, theory of motion and gravity and uh, thermodynamics and electricity and magnetism, all of that were just getting sewn up tight. All right? And then he said, but there are... And, and so physics today is really just about adding the next decimal place to your measurement. Yeah. Okay, so he basically denigrated the entire field by saying, now you're just bookkeeping. Okay, no new ideas to be found. But he said, but there are just a few clouds on the horizon, but I'm not, we're not going to worry about them. The few clouds, okay? And those few clouds became the birthing experiments for all of quantum physics. And in there also became the birthing um, things that needed explanation from Einstein's relativity. Mm -hmm. So he said this on the doorstep <laughs> of mm -hmm. modern physics, which completely transformed all of physics that we knew at the time. But it looked to him like a small problem that just a little extra attention would resolve. Yeah. So what I wonder is the 96% of the universe we don't understand, that feels like a big problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wonder if the actual problem is even bigger or whether it's a small thing that we've overlooked that would then explain it all. Yeah. Well, if I get these letters that I call theories of everything from outsiders, maybe once a, every couple months, you must get them every other every other hour, <laughs> considering your position. <laughs> uh, and of course, as you know, they all go, they, they make an argument like that. Like, I'm the next guy. I, I'm the Einstein. I'm the Galileo. I'm seeing the thing that you can't see. Here's my paper and, and so on. So, and so making the argument you just made, how would you respond to somebody like, like that? Yeah, I mean, I applaud the fact that I'm in a field where everybody wants to participate, okay, in a sort of the armchair uh, thinking. And by the way, <laughs> have you ever crowdsourced anything before? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> oh, a little bit. Okay, so for example, uh, if you crowdsource 
you get like a caption contest, right? Mm. So there's a cartoon or a photo. So we need a caption for this. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you post it. Oh, my gosh. The level of creativity out there mm -hmm. is boundless. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, oh, my gosh. And no, no, not everybody is that creative, but if the sample size is large enough, yeah. you're going to get the one in a million or the one in a hundred thousand, even the one in a thousand spark of clever insight into something to say or something to do about a problem. So I don't want to throw out all of crowdsourcing just with one fell swoop. There's still great value to it. And in a way, because so many people are interested in modern astrophysics, it's implicitly crowdsourced, right? Everybody wants a piece of that action. And I don't know if I get more of these letters than a geologist does. Are, are, you are do. people saying no. I have the solution to all of geology? I don't know. Yeah, you do. By the way, you do. the expanding... It's, it's, it's way more you know in those? the physical sciences and physics, cosmology, astronomy. There are some alternative uh, earth theories and things like that, but not, not as many as what you get. It's not with the depth and breadth of what what I would encounter. Okay, so because if I didn't know if they were just picking on my field or what, but I I think it's really true. That, so there's a crowdsourced element to it. The problem is that they believe they have this insight, but without any training or knowledge of everything you really should have studied mm -hmm. before you claim you have insight that no one else has. Mm -hmm. And the typical response is, "Well, I'm not biased," and 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 socialized by your mm -hmm. systems of learning so i can think outside of that and that's just false to believe that is to think that in science we all just want to huddle around and agree with each other mm -hmm. okay <laughs> and just propagate our own same ideas that is the opposite <laughs> mm -hmm. of what the moving frontier of science is all about so the fact that they don't have this background and they don't know the history and and uh, it becomes it becomes an inefficient investment of my time to track down their errors or call to their attention things that they're getting wrong. And I did a little bit of this in my letters from an astrophysicist. Yeah, I love that book. And thanks for, you had invited me on earlier for that. Thank you for that. That was fun because you're the guy, right? For a <laughs> lot of those letters and some of my insights and wisdom was drawn from your writings. I just want to thank you for that publicly. No, um, so, so, uh, just the tactics of arguing back, but in a way that don't turn, doesn't turn people off. So, so I don't, I just don't have the time to invest in that. Yeah. And so the people are frustrated and they think you're just trying to protect your own paradigms. And so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that is my answer. Yeah. They, <laughs> what I try to tell them is yeah. that, you know, science is a very social process. And you know, if you think that scientists are, again, huddled around just agreeing with each other, you never been to a conference. I mean, they, you know, they, there's bitter fights. And, um, uh, but at some point, you know, a scientific community reaches a consensus. So this is called consensus science, which, you know, like with climate science, that feels like it's some, like an argument from authority or it's, it's a democracy. No, no, no. It's, it's that if the people that are most expert in a field who used to disagree with each other and fight bitterly over ideas have now reached a consensus, there's a pretty good chance that it's a probably correct consensus, like climate change is an example. There you go. That's or evolution, right. yeah. Exactly. And that, um, uh, something I tell people that unlike debates that people have about religion or about, I mean, religious people fighting each other's religion or about politics, when two scientists walk into a room, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? <laughs> two scientists walk in a room, there's, a, there's an implicit contract that they've signed with each other. Mm -hmm. And that is either you're wrong and I'm right, or I'm wrong and you're right, or we're both wrong, right? One of those three outcomes, mm -hmm. one of those three will be true. And we both know that. So the arguments are, we, we, there's a chance that by the end of the discussion, we're in agreement. There's, an, there's a chance that that's the case. Or we agree that there's not enough data to distinguish the two arguments. And so we so we got to get more data. Let's go out and have a beer right now. I have never seen a political debate or religions arguing with each other where halfway through or at any time in the debate, they stand up and say, you know, you're right. Oh my gosh. 
I've been wrong all these years. Let's go have a beer. I've <laughs> just simply never seen that. Yeah. Or to say they're both wrong. Never seen it. There's a, there's a certain certainty mm -hmm. that the religious arguer has or the political arguer has that I find disappointing. Yeah. Because these are people who have great influence on society and culture and civilization, religious leaders, political leaders, cultural leaders. And to, to, to walk around with that level of, of, of confidence that what they think is right and everyone else is wrong. Yeah. I find that sort of mildly disturbing. I think they're confusing religious and political truths with scientific truths. So the political realm, if I say, well, I think, uh, the 37% uh, tax for uh, upper income uh, bracket is the correct one. And you say, no, no, I think it's 47%. And, and our friend over here says it's 20, should be 27%. And somebody else says it should be 77% like it was in the 50s. There's not a correct answer to that. It's not like we're going to run an experiment and figure out what's the right percent. All right. And I think of religious truths, you know, like, uh, you know, Jesus died for my sins, and, 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 but, but the uh, Jew doesn't say, the Jew says, no, I don't accept Jesus as the Savior. I, uh, I just don't. There's, there's no set of arguments or experiments we're going to run to figure out, well, is the Jew correct or is the Christian correct? Yeah, so, I, so <laughs> they don't, they're not actively thinking that could there be an experiment to decide if I'm right or you're right. Yeah. If that's not part of the thought, then it's just a fight on stage. And in the limit, in the politics and the religion, in the limit, it becomes war, outright slaughter. Remember that? Uh, in the name of a belief system. You and I were at that conference, that Beyond Belief conference down in, in, at the at Salk Institute. And, and we were on stage with uh, Richard Dawkins and somebody in the audience asked you, why aren't you more militant? This is right, right after uh, the, the God delusion came out and Richard was, you know, a superstar. And everybody was like, yeah, we got to be more militant. And, you know, and, and you're not particularly militant. You're much more conciliatory that way. And you gave the best answer. That viral went video. It's like, we don't need N plus one. Richard's yeah, doing such a great was... job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have... Yeah, what I did was, by the way, that was the first... By the way, Richard is one of my heroes. So, and that was the first time I'd ever met him. This is 2006. Mm -hmm. And I, I read his books and we're all jealous of his facility with the language because he's got that Oxford Brit... <laughs> training, you know, mm -hmm. cause we're just Americans here. <laughs> so he can communicate and he can write and he's poetic and he's strong and he's, and so, uh, and I was nervous actually. And I'm, I'm not often nervous, you know, <laughs> I'm not a nervous guy. I'm on this front there on the panel. And I, so yeah, I posed the, it's online. It's, it went viral in the day. That's pr that's pre, when was that pre YouTube or pre Facebook? It was yeah. 2006. Yeah. It's still before a lot of this could really go viral the way it does today. And I said, uh, Richard, um, I, listening to you speak, you know, I've only previously read your words. Now I can hear you. And hearing you speak, you are more barbed than anything I've ever read of what you've written. And so on a level where I could feel it. And mm -hmm. it was sharp and it was strong and it was like, oh my gosh. And I said to him, I said, have you ever considered that you are turning people off by this level of aggression? And it's brilliant aggression, but it's still a kind of an aggression. And, and <clears throat> maybe if you pulled, dialed it down a few notches, you could be much more effective in how far you reach. And what I remember is the room was completely silent <laughs> because here's this the whippersnapper, all right? <laughs> I, I'm up there and I'm criticizing everyone's hero and my hero. Okay? <laughs> and there was this like pregnant silence that was there. And then Richard says, I gratefully accept the rebuke. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a relief yes. in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So yeah, it's, I think it's worth digging up if you want to see this, the, this moment of, of, uh, uh, this battle of tactics yeah. of how to get a message across. It is a, it is a, a tactical dis a discussion of tactics, but I do wonder if in this keeping a part of your mind open to the possibility of other things that we just don't know, is something like a deity possible for you in the cosmos somehow? It doesn't have to be the anthropocentric Christian God, anything like that, the, the God of Abraham. It could, could just be a 
super far advanced extraterrestrial intelligence that so powerful is indistinguishable from omniscience and omnipotence and you know ancient humans would call it god we would just call it whatever yeah i <clears throat> th thanks for that question that's an important question and i've thought a lot about that believe it or not and i've arrived at a place and that's the answer i'm going to give you now but maybe there are other places I could arrive and that my answer would be different a year from now because this has sort of evolved within me. So here it is. I am completely comfortable with the idea that our intelligence is something minuscule, pale compared to the intelligence of some other life form that does or does not choose to visit us here on Earth where they see us the way we see worms. When you walk by worms crawling out from the fresh rain onto the sidewalk, are you saying, gee, I wonder what you're thinking, worm. Gee, I want to study, you know, unless you're a nematodologist, <laughs> you don't really care what the worm is thinking. That's how much greater your intellect is to that of the worm. So now imagine some other life form. With, and I, you know, I'm okay with that. Where I'm just a drooling, blithering idiot, and they want to make us their pets. Well, if I'm okay with that, let's just follow that reasoning further. I ought to be okay with something that's so intelligent and so brilliant and so powerful that maybe it created Earth for us, and Earth is part of its zoo. It's its ant, you know, with the ant mm -hmm. farm, mm -hmm. right? Do the ants know they're in an ant farm? I don't know. They they're busy, so it looks like they don't really care. Um, do we know where we're in a zoo? No. Does the penguin know in a zoo that? The wall that has a painted a painted ice flow and <laughs> chunks of ice floating and they keep it cold, does it know it's not in Antarctica? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do we know we're not, if, can we, could we detect that we are in a zoo if we were? Well, not if we're smart, if we're too dumb, not, not if we're dumb, okay? So people had this argument with regard to uh, AI. Can you keep AI in a box? And I initially I said, of course you can. And plus, if AI gets out, you just shoot it. Okay, <laughs> <Unplug> <laughs> it. <laughs> pull your gun out. AI is not <laughs> taking over my life. All right. <laughs> and then I thought about it. And I said, no, I changed my mind on that. Hmm. No, the a the AI gets out of the box every time. If it's smarter than you, mm -hmm. it gets out of the box every time. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that? Because you can lock a dog in a room. And there's the, the dog is not going to get out of the room. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's no what it can whimper and things, and you can like cut a hole and look in and throw it some food. But no, if you want to lock a dog in a room, the dog is never getting out. Okay, it's not going to outwit you any more than you're going to outwit truly brilliant AI. Okay, and I thought it through. I gave examples to myself of how the AI would get out of a box in conversation with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, AI would say. You know, I, I know your mother, um, your mother is dying of cancer. Well, I just, I just uh, created a formula that if you give this to the pharmacy, they can put together this combination and she'll be cured overnight. Uh, but I'll give that to you only if you let me out. <laughs> it's like, damn. <laughs> okay. Um, and by the way, AI could be lying or telling the truth. In either case, it's mm. quite compelling. <laughs> okay. Unlock the door. So AI gets out of the box. My point is, if I can believe that such a thing can exist and levels of alien intelligence can get so high, you, you follow that thread, at some point, you'll reach what any one of us would call God. Right. And so I, I don't have any problems imagining that there could be something that we would functionally call God. Yeah. The way we would functionally call God technology that's really advanced magic okay to yeah, partially yeah, quote yeah. arthur c clark um any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic any sufficiently advanced intelligence is indistinguishable from god yeah that yeah. would be a a a a natural extension of this concept of no we're not necessarily the top of the intelligence heap so exploring the universe, if I come upon a computer out there and God waves to me, I have I don't have an issue with that. And is that any different from us living in a simulation? 
Yeah, one of your tweets. The you God said, of that simulation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree the with kid that. Kid living I, in the basement of there. That was one of my Scientific American columns. Shermer's last law: any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. <laughs> because I don't believe in there naming laws after yourself. <laughs> anyway, um, one of your <laughs> tweets in the book is that um, on, on this uh, subject of AI taking over, just don't give it emotions. And here you're hinting at the idea that this idea of colonizing, enslaving, taking over, conquering is a very kind of human emotional thing, especially kind of a male thing. And uh, Steve Pinker makes a funny point in, in Enlightenment Now. He has a section on AI as an existential threat where he says there are intelligent beings that uh, are sentient and, and capable of all these things that don't want to conquer and colonize and enslave people. They're called women. Just a funny line. <laughs> so it's kind of a male trait. Uh, but Steve's point is that these um, sort of AI existential threat uh, writers tend to think of it as a kind of a male sci-fi scenario. Whereas, in fact, the other line of arguments that you discuss in, in, in the book and in one of your Star Talk episodes uh, is the paperclip, uh, universal paper clip maker that doesn't even know it's making paper clips and it, and it uses all the material that it has to make paper clips, including you standing there, the room, and pretty soon the whole planet and the whole universe is nothing but paper clips. It doesn't, it's not trying to enslave Just you. To it clear, doesn't. That, that argument I think originated with uh, Steve B Bostrom B over in Oxford B Bostrom, that yeah. we recount yeah. in the book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So that's slightly different though than from the, you know, we're fear, we afraid of the robots taking over. This is the robots don't even know they're taking over. They're just doing their thing. Do you worry about that? Yeah, so the robots that are, are single-minded, that's, that's not AI, right? AI is, is everything that we are except way smarter. Mm. And, we're, and we know not to just turn everything into paper clips. Uh, so, the, so the robot that makes paper clips, I don't even know why that's in anybody's conversation. <laughs> yeah. uh, I never really feel it's, it's in there for completeness. But um, it's what happens if something becomes single-minded, and maybe that's a... That's an off ramp that you want to sort of tie off and make sure that your future programming protects you against that. But right, because there's no moral judgment involved. You gave them the prime directive and they're fulfilling it. And so do you put them in prison for that? No, because you're the one that programmed <laughs> them to do it. Right. But AI that has high levels of reasoning. I was in conversation with our guy. Who's the one who's a big proponent of the singularity? Um, Kurzweil? What's the guy's name? Uh, Ray Kurzweil? Say again? No, Ray Kurzweil. So I was once on stage with Ray Kurzweil, and uh, he's got such good answers to questions that, that have perplexed me. And I don't necessarily like his answers, but they're just so good that, that they, they, they send me back to think some more, all right, even if I don't like his answers. So uh, we're talking about um, the next evolution of what AI could be. And what he said was, uh, what distinguishes humans, of course, from other other animals is the the development of our, our, our frontal lobe our prefrontal cortex i guess is the full expression of it and in there we're pretty sure that's where high level abstract reasoning occurs you compare our brains to that of reptiles ours so it's, it's there so we have good reason to suggest that when we do art and philosophy if that all emanates from this part of our brain and other animals that don't have a fully developed part of that brain, that they're not doing art and philosophy, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have an argument against that. that. I'm with you on that, okay? So we can do things they can't, and because we have that part of the brain. He's saying, if you can take the internet and make it interconnected in such a way that it's now part of your brain, the internet and all its wisdom and all the knowledge and all the everything becomes the... Think of it as an evolutionary next step where your frontal lobe itself gets a frontal lobe. Mm, mm -hmm. And then you can ask if whatever is our abstract reasoning does for us, what level of reasoning are we missing? Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the frontal lobe of a frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. What depth and breadth of, of thinking, thought, and problem solving are we like reptiles uh, relative to whatever that entity would be? And that he sent me, uh, just sent me home. With that. <laughs> it was like, uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 uh. He, he's a really and smart, so, he's a really smart guy. 
Um, although, yeah, see, yeah. again, That's here, you, you, you know, here it's like the heat problem. You know, how many layers of neurons do you get before you get self-awareness? Well, what do you mean by self-awareness? You know, that you're aware that you're aware and you're aware that you're aware that you're aware or something like that. So maybe if you had three more cortexes or if you had a brain the size of Jupiter, you know, you would under, you'd be omniscient or something like that. You know, and, you know, now we're in the. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 why are we the measure of what it is to be aware of anything? Right. <laughs> as far as we know, higher level of intelligence has a depth of 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 awareness that makes us look like, you know, the ants in the ant farm. Right. And I, I'm I'm OK with that. I don't like it, but I'm OK with it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun being on top. Deal with it. <laughs> All right, Neil, we're uh, we're over an hour and a half. I I, I want to I don't want to eat up too much of your time, but I, I want to talk yeah, a, I talk about the schedule. the final chapter okay. of the book is on the big rip. You first told me about the big rip a few weeks ago when we were on the phone and I was on a bike ride and I was going up a really steep hill. And the further off uh, on you went about the the end of the universe, I just wanted to stop because <laughs> it's like, what's the point? <laughs> it's all gonna rip apart <laughs> in the end. I felt like Woody Allen's character. You know, I, I don't want to do my homework because the universe is expanding. There's no point. <laughs> anyway, what's the, what's the big rip? How's this all gonna end? Wait, the rep- response to that was in Brooklyn, the universe is not. <laughs> That's expanding. right. Yeah, I think it was what that was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, the big rip uh, of the many scenarios that are explored in how the, everything will end. Um, the reason why there are multiple scenarios is because there's there are uncertainties today that don't allow us to distinguish one from another. So what we do is we say, if it turns out this way, then you get this result. If it turns out the other way, mm-hmm. then we get this other result. And so that's why these multiple endings are explored. And the one that just completely terrifies me is the knowledge that, we're yes, we're in an accelerating, expanding universe, but that could... Um, the, the accelerating universe initially will sort of accelerate the outer galaxies beyond our horizon. So it'll basically start picking off the galaxies from our night sky. All right, uh, I, I'll deal with that. And then it becomes so powerful, it overrides the gravitational attraction of the collective gravitational field of our galaxy. Mm. Then it'll start ripping stars out of your night sky. Well, actually, stars are long dead by then, but just... Just picture this anyway. It starts ripping them out of your night sky. Then it starts ripping planets away from their star systems. Then it starts ripping, then the, the, the strength of it overrides the electromagnetic forces that are holding your molecules together. And all of this gets sent beyond your horizon. And so space-time continues to stretch mm. as this goes on. And, th- and then it rips apart the atoms themselves. Then it gets down to the particles themselves, the subatomic particles. And you get deep within that, and you reach the limit. Mm. And the limit is the Planck. This is the smallest unit of space-time that can possibly exist. The quantum measure. That it's it's like the it's like the pixels of the universe are are found in what's called the Planck length, and when the expansion of the universe begins to stretch that, it can't. Mm. That's an unstretchable unit of the Planck all length. there is. The Planck length. And so you can't do anything to the Planck length. It is what it is. And so there's no other option here except for it to rip. Mm. You've, re- you've reached the limits of the flexibility of the fabric. And when that <laughs> happens, the fabric knows nothing else but to rip and i don't even want to wonder what that would be like no because that's scary i lost i've lost after i formulated all of that for the book and laid it out it was like damn i need like a milk and cookies or something <laughs> you know hot milk and cookies. that's even worse than your uh spaghettification of when you fall into a black hole oh yeah so when you fall into a black hole that's just you falling into the black hole. That's not the end of everything. That's just the end of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad enough. <laughs> but if all the fabric of space-time rips, what is between the rip? What 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 oozes out from behind that? Uh, so yeah, that's in there. We we, we this is some mind-blowing stuff. It, it is. It's it's an amazing book. Yeah, really the big picture. Uh it, it's amazing we can even figure this stuff out. 
much less communicate it uh, at, uh, attribute well, to well, our species. We figure out what we don't know and to at least give options of yeah. things that still need more work. And yeah. that's why this book was question-driven rather than answer-driven. Yeah, I love that different. approach. Well, Neil, a final yeah. unknown. I don't know what you're working on next. What what comes? Is there a, a, a Cosmos 3 or or just more Star Talks or another book? Yeah, yeah. So we got more uh, Star Talk is coming along. Uh, it might uh, jump species again and, and go to uh, television. So we're we're working on that. Oh. And it was on TV with National Geographic, and that established that relationship, which led to the. This is the second of two Nat Geo books published hmm. um, with them. But uh, in the interim of all of that, Disney ended up buying National Geographic from mm. Fox. Mm. And that just totally complicated everything. So we're trying to reestablish relationships there and see mm. see where that comes. Uh, I, I'm always thinking about what could be a book that is needed on the horizon, not just something I want to write, but something that would be welcomed. Because um, there's so many books out there. There's no reason why anyone a, should uh, care about any next book. How about a memoir? Well, I wrote a memoir 20 years ago, actually. And when I was invited to do so, I said, do you know something about my life expectancy that I don't? <laughs> right. I asked them. Yeah. <laughs> and that memoir is called The Sky is Not the Limit. And, oh, right. Uh, That's right. Was, uh, my life up until that point, a, a lot had happened. Um, and much more has happened since then. But I don't, I'm not interested in a memoir because mm. that means I'm assuming people are interested in me. Mm. And whether or not that's true, I'd rather you be interested in what I teach you mm. as an educator. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, what do you want to be remembered for? Nothing. <laughs> what do you want your statue to be? I don't want a statue. Mm -hmm. Just Here's my, my, my epitaph. I, I say that you quote Horace Mann, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Mm. That's, that's all I want. That's perfect. That's a good place to end it, Neil. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. your work. Thanks for your friendship. You're you're one of the most interesting, intelligent, thoughtful people uh, writing today. So, don't don't check out anytime soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Michael. Keep it going. You need the skeptics on the horizon. That's right.